Today, we are going to talk about the limitations of WAC as a discount rate. By far, WAC is the most popular discount rate used when we do firm valuations. However, it is very frequent that people who use this formula tend to ignore that the assumptions behind its formulation makes make the application of the formula difficult in many situations. In this video, the limitation of WAC will be discussed. First of all, recall how WAC values a company. According to the WAC discount rate, we should project first the, uh, the, uh, the unlevered free cash flow after taxes. So we assume that the firm does not pay any interest just to project the free cash flow. And then we find the value of the firm by discounting this free cash flow, this free unlevered free cash flow after taxes, discounting them at the one rate. And the resulting value is the value of the leveraged firm that is taking into account the discount of interest for tax purposes. As all of you probably know, the Watt formula is given by this expression here. First, we have the debt ratio, which is the market value of the debt divided by uh, the value of the firm, multiplied by 1 minus TC, which is 1 minus the corporate tax rate, and then also multiplied by the discount rate on the debt. And then we add a second term, in which we have the ratio between equity and the value of the firm, market value, multiplied by RE, which is the discount rate on equity. And all these values are after taxes. And graphically, we can represent this formula in this way. First, we have a vertical axis in which we have percentages that represent the discount rate on equity, WAC, and the discount rate on debt. And we must show here this row rate. This row rate represents the discount rate of the unlevered firm. So uh, if we apply to the free cash flow after taxes, assuming no interest, if we apply this row rate to apply to, to calculate the present value, we obtain then the value of the unlevered firm. And in the horizontal axis, we have leverage in terms of the market value of the debt divided by the value of the firm. And then we have several curves here. First, we have RE, the curve corresponding to RE. RE is the discount rate on equity. And we see that RE increases as leverage goes up. And RE starts with the value equal to rho when leverage is zero. Then we have another curve here that represents the discount rate of debt which also increases with leverage. And finally, we have the red line here that represents WAC, the WAC rate. And we can observe that the WAC rate goes down as leverage increases. The main assumption of the WAC formula are the following. First, there is no transaction cost. So there are no informational asymmetries, it is free to do business in the economy. Um, there is no cause of financial distress, etc. Second, there are no agency costs. This means that there is only one goal, which is maximizing, maximizing shareholders' wealth. So there is no conflict of interest between management and equity holders. Both seek the same objective, maximizing uh, the shareholders' wealth. Third, we have no personal taxes. We only account for corporate tax through the corporate tax rate TC. Fourth, the capital structure is only composed of plain bonds and shares, meaning that we don't have uh, complex financial instruments. And finally, all cash flows are perpetuities. And also, there is a constant and unique corporate tax rate. Let's look now at the limitations that stem from this assumption. 
we are we are going to focus on four limitations. First, the relationship between RD, meaning the discount rate on debt, and the real interest cash flow. Second, the relationship between what and the value of the firm. Third, the assumption that cash flows are perpetuities. And four, that we have only corporate taxes and a single corporate tax rate, TC. Let's start with the first limitation, RD and interest flow. The work formula accounts for the cost of debt, net of taxes, using this expression, RD multiplied by one minus TC. If you go back to the work formula, you see that in the leverage side, we multiply leverage ratio D over, over, over D, multiply, we multiply that by RD multiplied by one minus TC. And the rationale is that the after tax cost of debt is given by this expression. So we take the interest that we are paying, RD, and then we subtract uh, the taxes on this interest, and then we get the after tax cost of debt. However, this expression is only correct as long as RD corresponds to the real flow of interest payments on the firm that is deductible for tax purposes. For instance, imagine a company that issues a bond with a, an 8% coupon. And over time, interest rates in the market rise and the uh, value of the debt goes down. In consequence, the discount rate on the debt increases, the internal rate of return of the debt increases. And the new RD of the debt actually is different from the 8% original coupon. However, the 8% coupon is the one that is being actually deducted for tax purposes. So this is the problem. When the discount rate of debt is different from the actual interest cash flow, then uh, the, the work formula fails. The second thing we, we want to discuss is uh, the relationship between WAC and value. Generally, we need the WAC discount rate to find the value of a firm. So we do not have the value of the firm when we, uh, when we uh, are using WAC usually. However, if you look back at the WAC formula, you realize that you need the value of the firm to calculate the WAC because these values, the value of the firm, the value of the equity, and the value of the debt, and the WAC formula must be market values. So you need the value of the firm to calculate the WAC and you need WAC to calculate the value of the firm. So we have here a chicken and egg or a circularity problem. The third thing we want to discuss is corporate taxes. As we said before, the WAC formula assumes that the only tax effect of leverage is the deductibility of interest, meaning that uh, when you leverage the company, the only impact on taxes due to leverage is through the deductibility of the interest payments. The other assumption is that we'll have a constant, unique corporate tax rate. However, often tax laws are different from this. Mostly in emerging markets, you see much more complex tax laws that imply tax effects related to the debt, which are different from the simple uh, effect that we described before of the deductibility of interest. For instance, inflation adjustments, which is very common in emerging markets. Also, it is possible that the tax rates are not constant over the projection period. So when we have this problem with corporate taxes, the uh, work formula in principle could not be applied. The other point is uh, the assumption of cash flows as perpetuities. As we said before, the work formula assumes that all cash flows are perpetuities. When this is not the case, in principle, the work formula does not apply. And of course, that is the usual situation. The usual situation is that cash flows are not perpetuities, at least during the uh, period of projection. Usually, this problem is tackled by, uh, by analysts by calculating either a different work for each period or an average work for the overall projection period. However, it can be shown that this practice leads to important errors. 
So, now we are going to conclude. The work formula is problematic whenever, first, the actual interest paid on the debt is different from the discount rate of the debt. Second, the market value of the first debt and equity are unknown. Third, tax laws imply other tax effects related to the debt, for instance, inflation adjustment, and or tax rates are not constant over the cash flow projection. And fourth, cash flows are not perpetuities. And this is all I wanted uh, to discuss with you today.